relates to the scriptures. Prophecy.com. It's, it's uh, very simple, it's easy to understand, and it, it is right on, because I've been reading it for years and making sure it was right on. It's right on with your Bible. You know, I was thinking this week how I don't think many people, I know you do, but many people understand the importance of the Bible study that we do. Because uh, we have people who come in, I mean, you guys are well versed, you guys are grounded. Uh, someone want to teach you something that's not right, you're going to perk up and say, wait a minute, <laughs> something wrong there. But a lot of the people who come to our Bible studies have never heard the things that we teach. Uh, many of them, I mean, it would surprise you, many of them believe that there was just one general uh, uh, judgment. Uh, they believe that Israel had been replaced by the church. Uh, many, of them, many of them are taught that uh, they have no choice in salvation. I mean, there's a lot of things that they, and they had no idea that the Bible was divided into, into uh, dispensations. They had no idea that the governments belonged to, uh, the covenants belonged to Israel, and that Israel had been set aside. And I mean, and as far as Revelation, they're not taught the book of Revelation. So it's very important the work that's done here, and it's very important for those Bible studies. And some of the people who were here last year, in fact, just about everyone who was here last year returned this year. And they are learning, and they are excited about what they're learning. And, you know, the uh, one gentleman that really touched my heart, I mean, I never teach a class, you know, that one of them doesn't come up and say, wow, I've been in church for 40 years, why haven't I ever heard that? You know, and that's why I go to all the trouble printing up all the chapter and verses and doing all these pages because I want them to know it's chapter and verse, not my opinion. <laughs> okay? And they always come up and say, well, I've never heard that before. That just makes sense, and it's falling in place, and that's the whole idea. To go over it and over it and over it is for it to fall in place, or they can rightly divide the Word of God. But one gentleman really touched my heart. Uh, this year, and he has been in church about all his life, the same church. And he had been taught that Israel was no more, and that the people over there were just occupying the land, and that there are a bunch of criminals, and that the church has replaced Israel, and that the church, all the covenants and, and everything belongs to Israel, and that we are in <laughs> And so I gave him scriptures, and he came all last year, and then he came again this year, and, and one evening he stopped me out back, and he was in tears. And he said, I see that. He said, I, I can't believe that. He said, I read it over and over and over again. And he said, why? Why do we know this? And here's why. The devil has counterfeited. He has corrupted. He is trying to keep people in darkness, and what he's working on mostly the last few years is the generation beneath us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because just like in the Old Testament, the plan was to raise up a generation that knew not God. That was their plan. Well, we can't get you to turn away, so what we're going to do is raise up the next generation that doesn't know God. That's Satan's plan. And in doing so, they have to corrupt the Bible. They have to, you know, it's just like the government. In the government, I had this thought this morning, the government, we have the right wing, we have the left wing, we have swing vote, you know, then we have people who just don't vote at all. I mean, they have no opinion whatsoever. You know, we have the progressives, and of course that's the liberal, more liberal. But we see this also in the spiritual realm. We see this also in the churches. You've got your right wing, you've got your left wing, you've got the progressive, and then you've got people who really don't care one way or the other. And I have found, you know, come April, I've been teaching for 42 years, and the one thing that I hear so often and, and heard for so many years was, why do we need to know that? Why is that important? As long as you know Jesus crucified, you know, risen again, that's all you need to know. Why do we need to know that? Well, we, now we've entered a realm where if you don't know these things, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're really in trouble. Because we've raised up generations who don't know 
who don't know the Word of God. So it's very important that we study God's Word and that we share it with others. You know, there's what you call seeker-friendly churches. And, and I was listening to a conversation on the radio. You know, they ask what the Bible man or whatever, you know, well, just exactly what is a seeker-friendly church because I'm from the UK and I'm a born-again Christian and I've never really heard about a seeker-friendly church. I'd like to know what that means. This was his answer. Listen. Well, well. <laughs> it is a new way to reach Christians and the unchurched. Unchurched. Okay. The major theme is to not offend people anymore. Therefore, we can't talk about sin, hell, <laughs> repentance, the blood of Christ, etc. Or sing songs that do. Now this was his answer. Okay. Or sing songs that do. The church services are to entertain, to draw in the people, and explain to them how Christ can help them to be better people and have better lives. Much of that. So true. On their way to hell. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and it's mostly motivational. And that's what he said that a seeker friendly church is. And I remember when the seeker friendly church began. They sent out letters to all the, all the people in the surrounding communities, and this was, you know, all the way across the United States, and they were asking their people, what is it you would like to hear in the church services? What would you change if you could change it? Uh, what would you like to have taught? And so on. And they got all these letters back, and so they became seeker-friendly churches to bring the unchurched in and to reach the church and to keep their church big and to, to not offend anyone. And what they did in doing that was drop the word of God pretty much and just stay with the Gospels. And we've been talking about that for several weeks. I've mentioned it several times in the Bible studies uh, Wednesday night and Thursday night. And just to show you how quickly this is happening, the Pope, Pope Francis, who was a Jesuit. Remember we studied about the Jesuits and how they were the militant group that was formed during the 1500s to, to counteract the Reformation. They were the ones who, who worked diligently with the Inquisitions and, and they were the bloodletters. <laughs> I mean, they were the ones who fought, you know, to keep the Reformation fires from burning. And, and I know in the 1600s, they fought to destroy the Word of God and to only have the Word of God in the hands of the Catholic leaders at the time. You know, and so these Jesuits who were the militant, I mean, and you can find that out yourself. All you have to do is look it up in the, in the uh, encyclopedias or in your history books. I was reading it again this morning. And their goal was to, to fight the... Reformation and to bring back all the erring denominations into one big universal church. And so Pope Francis has sent out this very same letter that was sent out by the secret friendly churches and this letter, I mean not the same letter, but the same message in this letter. And in this letter there was three things that he wanted to know how the people felt about same-sex marriage. <laughs> how they felt about birth control, which would be abortion as well, women's rights, and how they felt about divorce. Because to bring all the erring brothers, all the Protestants back, they're going to have to change a few things, okay? To, to make everybody want to come back into one church and not offend any group. And I know when, when the Pope was put into his office, he said the three things that he was not going to really press would be abortion and uh, divorce and homosexuality. That he just wasn't going to press those three things, that those were the three things that was dividing the people, and he wanted to bring the people together, so not to offend. So he sent out this letter. It would be inter interesting to see what the response will be. But his goal as a Jesuit, and by the way, the first Jesuit pope, there's never been 
a Jesuit pope. This is the first one. And their hope is to restore the Catholic Church from all the problems that they have had. Okay? So the goal was to reunite the church into one universal church. And what they did, after sending out this letter, now he's on the road, he went to Russia to speak to the Greek Orthodox. Now if you remember when we studied the seven stages of the church, at, during Constantine, Constantine went to Constantinople and that's where they started the Greek Orthodox Church. It's where the two legs of the Roman Catholic Church split. One went to the Roman Catholic and one went to the Greek Orthodox. Okay, remember that was your first split. And so he wants to bring them back together and in hopes of bringing them back together, reuniting them, then to bring the other denominations back in all in the name of love and unity. Mm -hmm. And they use, and it's not just the Catholic Church that does this, yeah. they use the word love and unity, which, is, which are good words. We want love, we want unity, we want peace, but at what cost? Right. And the cost is to drop the doctrines and the foundation that was to erode it to very, just very slowly take this piece out, and take this piece out, and take this piece out. And remember I told you, I think it was one, one lesson last year, we talked about chrism, mm -hmm. and how the secret friendly churches have tried to bring together the Muslims and the Christians. In fact, the Horn has spoke at that big Muslim convention each year, in hopes of finding the common denominator rather than focus on the things that separate to find the common things and just stay on the fact. So Wycliffe, which really was shocking to me that it was Wycliffe who did this, uh, they printed up a Muslim-friendly Bible, removing Jesus. I, I would like to get my hands on one of them, but then at the same time I wouldn't be able to understand it anyway. But they removed Jesus and anything that would offend the Muslims in hopes of reaching them. Now here is my question then, now, and even with these other Bibles that we're going to talk about today, because I'd like to keep you in the know of what's happening, that you can share it with other people. What are they reaching them for? Mm -hmm. If they can't reach them for Jesus Christ and to keep them from going to hell, and if they can't speak about Jesus Christ, although the Muslims believe in hell, and they believe we're all going there, <laughs> okay, uh, they didn't want to present Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Son of God, so they printed up these millions of Bibles that were Muslim-friendly Bibles and have sent them all over the world into the Middle Eastern countries. And they said the reason why is to reach the Muslims. And here we have the seeker-friendly people wanting to reach people to give them a better life, you know, <laughs> and, and make them a better person. But no one is talking about the Great Commission and why we have this book in the first place. And what the purpose is, is to reach other people to get them saved, to keep them from going to hell. But they're not going to preach hell. And some of us have experienced that in some of the churches that we have been in. They're not going to preach hell. They're not going to preach sin. They don't want to offend. They just want you to have the best life that you can possibly have. And so each week they want to motivate you. It's like having a life coach. <laughs> you know? Yes. You do it. Get out there. Do it. Do it. Do it. You know? Instead of... You know, through Christ, all things are possible. It's all things are possible. Just get out there and do it. See, they're leaving out Christ. And we're seeing it more and more and more and more. They have now what they call the Golden Rule Bible, which they are translating the word homosexual into another word. <clears throat> because they're saying that Jesus Christ never preached against homosexuality, which he didn't use that word. <laughs> you know, he didn't use it. Like, that's like people say, well, dinosaur is not in your Bible. Well, no, they didn't create that work to the 1800s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no wonder it's not in the Bible. Right. You know? 
that they didn't come, a woman came up with the word dinosaur. It's not going to be in your Bible. But they say, oh, well, homosexual is not in your Bible, so there is no such thing. You know? And God is not against it. So they have what they call the Golden Rule Bible, and I'll read, it to, I'll read a, a bit about it here in a minute. Then they have a movement called the Postmodern Prophetic Paradigm. Now, in Colorado this year, they had a huge prophecy conference. And in this prophecy conference, they said that the Word of God, the Bible, is not the final authority on end-time events. Okay. That it's not the final authority at all. <clears throat> yeah, God has something to say about it, and we have this in the scriptures. And they're saying that in this new modern world, we have to stick to things that are relative, you know. But I'm telling you, as a person who listens to the news a lot and studies the Word of God. There's nothing more relative than what's going on in the world today. It's in your Bible. The Bible is like reading the newspaper. I mean, it's all there. God said it'd be just like it is right now, and it is just like it is. Just like he said thousands of years ago. So we're finding more and more of these things happening. What that means to us is, is that Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. And we need to understand that it's good news. They're saying that there's no absolutes. And that there's more, so here's their statement, there are more sources than the Bible of relative truth. More sources of the Bible than relative truth. That it's not the absolute truth. It's not the final authority of future events. And you know, you think, well, how can I live this long and hear them talk about the Bible like that? But it's nothing new under the sun. You know, Oprah said something this week, and, and I personally don't like Oprah. Uh, but she said this week that the only reason that there's problems in the government is because our president is black. And it really has nothing to do with the fact that he's black. He's half black and half white. I mean, what difference does it make? But they are going to use that. This is, I said that to tell you this. Oprah and the president went to the same church. The president went there for 22 years that that's teach, right. and that's right, it teaches anti-Americanism. It teaches anti-America. 22 years. Right? It teaches race and hatred for the white. America's chicken. It teaches, yes, it, it teaches that, now this is what really gets me, is that he teaches that Jesus is a way, not the way. And Oprah changed from the time she, as she was being raised, in fact, she was raised in a Baptist church, and her family were uh, born-again Christians. And when she started attending this church, she said she finally realized that Jesus wasn't the way, he was a way. And he was just one way, that there were many, many ways to God. And this is exactly what our president has been taught as well in this church. So neither one so, <laughs> so when you hear these other things about the postmodern prophetic prophecy conferences and you realize what they're saying is that the word of God is not the absolute and that Jesus is not the only way, that there's more ways than one to get saved, there's many, many roads, and you can see how, how we are quickly falling into that Revelation chapter 17. Where the great whore, false religion, all joins together <laughs> into one huge universal church. And that all the smaller ones will be committing spiritual fornication with the great whore by going along with what they say. And how easy it is for people to fall into this. So I want to read this. I don't usually read... And then we're going to read our scriptures. I don't usually read from a magazine, but I'm telling you, this is really important. It's very important. It's called The Biblical Bottom Line. Now, just indulge me for a few minutes, because this is really good. He says, I was watching a television talk show one evening that centered on a discussion between the host, a well-known skeptic, 
and a spokesman for the evangelical left. Okay? Political and social issues swirled throughout the conversation, and before long, the religious one, the religious fellow, began backtracking. You know why? Because their beliefs are not convictions. That's why. Your belief, you shouldn't just believe something. It should be a total yes. conviction that you're willing to die for. I mean, it's a conviction. Okay? But they start swaying back. Oh, well, maybe. Oh, well. Why? Because they're not grounded. They don't have the chapter and verse to back it up. That He said, he implied it was appropriate. Now, this is what he told him. This is what the Christian said. He implied, it is appropriate to ignore the politically incorrect parts of the Bible. <laughs> Let me read this again, because I want this to soak in. This is what he, this is what he initiates. Uh, he said, uh, he implied it is appropriate to ignore the politically incorrect parts of the Bible and focus instead on the more palatable <laughs> principles that Jesus expressed in the Gospels. Gospels. So what are they doing? They're going right back to the four Gospels. And apparently they're not even reading the four Gospels. <laughs> Jesus was pretty tough. Yes, before and how. <laughs> you know? He told them there was a generation of vipers, the snakes. You know, that they were white on the outside and black inside. That they were dirty. You know? And I mean, he was tough. But they said, no, we need to stick to the Gospels. We need to do away with the New Testament, the epistles, and Paul. I mean, your own president said he hated Paul because he was a bigot. So we need to do away with all the scriptures except the four Gospels. Right? Jefferson, our president Jefferson, did the same thing. There is a Jefferson Bible that has all the verses from the Gospels. Nothing else. <laughs> okay? Said so we need to stick to them, and what they're saying is, is that most of the most of the things that Jesus said are probably right, but the rest of the gospels aren't. Just the things he said. So you need to stick to the red letter. He said, "Well, who well, have I never heard?" You need to. No, you don't need to visit some of these churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is what is being taught. Mm -hmm. It's just gradually getting the people to where. Well, if Jesus didn't say it. I don't want to hear it, but the Bible says all Scripture is inspired of God. All Scripture. Okay? But listen to what he said. We need to ignore the politically incorrect parts. In other words, if it says that gay marriage or gay is an abomination, we need to ignore that altogether. <clears throat> you know, we need to ignore all the things he says about family, home, all that. We need to ignore that. He says, if it's politically incorrect, we need to ignore that and focus instead on the principles that Jesus expressed in the Gospels. Ignoring the fact <coughs> excuse me, that Jesus said some profound, profoundly strong, even culturally incendiary things, which he did. The discussion illuminated an important fact. There are always forces that seek to erode the truth of God's word. Discount its value and twist its meaning. Those are the three things that Satan has been working on, especially since 1950s. And the Jesuits played a big part in this. Because through the 1600s, 1700s, they were fighting the Reformation and the different denominations that broke away from the church and wanted them to come back in. After a while, they realized this is working. <laughs> okay? So we're going to infiltrate the universities, the colleges, the schools. We're going to go incognito. We're going to go out in among the people and become one of them and erode it from within and raise up generations that don't know. We will offer them more palatable things. And this is what the Jesuits did. I mean, read it. It's in your... But see, people aren't paying attention to any of this. <laughs> Why? Another thing, you know, I've got to thinking, if, if you were Satan, what would you do? 
to keep people from knowing these things. Well, you probably have so much drama in their personal life that they don't have time for God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you probably work on the economy where man had to work all the time just to live. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'd work on the people to where they thought they had to have everything. You know, the things that I worked and my husband worked for for 40 years, when my kids got married, they thought they had to have it all at the same time. Right. <laughs> you know? That's right. And That's a lot right. of the things they got, I still hadn't. <laughs> still didn't have. But it's, they raised, you know, this is the way it is. Generation to generation to generation. And this is how Satan has worked. How do, and if you look at it, it's the church that's failed. We haven't taught the people. We haven't taught them, and they need to be taught. Let's finish this. Ignoring the fact what Jesus said, there are forces that seek to erode the truth of God's Word. That's what they're doing. Just tear away the foundation. Okay, let's take out Revelation. Let's take out Israel. Let's take out the doctrines. Let's do away with the Old Testament. I mean, that's, it's over anyway. Let's just stick with the, the Gospels. And in fact, let's do away with the Gospels except for the words that's in red. This is what they're doing. Right? But people don't know it. They don't want to know. This is what he says. And there are forces that seek to erode the truth of God's word, discount its value. I mean, it's not the absolute. It's not the absolute truth. There are other sources of truth. <laughs> okay? And twist its meaning. When God said it's, it's of no private interpretation. It says what it means. It means what it says. I mean, how else do you, and I don't want to get vulgar here, but how else do you reinterpret, how do you interpret man laying with man as, as with woman and lusting after him? Okay, how are we going to interpret that? Or woman left lusting after woman. How are we going to interpret that? How are we going to interpret the fact that he says it's an abomination? Right. I, how are they going to reinterpret that? And it's not just the gays. I mean, it's, it's all, all the things shit. that's going on in the world today. <laughs> the child pornography and all. And now they're wanting to say, oh, let's call it child love. No, let's mm. call it what it is. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay? You know, they, they put all these new names. Drunks are now alcoholics. <laughs> you know, I mean, they just keep... And now they're saying that a person kills another person because there's a gene in there. <laughs> What are they doing? They're making excuses for the people. He said, yet we must be particularly alert when the compass of our entire culture seems to point toward a false north. Boy, if you can't see that we're headed in the wrong direction in this country, I mean, do you see the smoke screen that's going on in this country? You turn the news on and all you hear is what? Obamacare. Obamacare. Yes. Obamacare. I mean, now that's bad enough. It is bad enough. But do you know they're, they're real? You realize they're not talking about the things that are happening all over the world. Right. Bad stuff. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's right. In Geneva, they're having, what is it, a P15 conference with the, uh, with the UN and Iran and Germany and Russia. And I think it's very interesting that they're discussing Iran having the nuclear capabilities, but Israel's left out of the message, and Israel's the one they want to blow all the hell. <laughs> but let's not forget this. When they're done with Israel, guess who they're coming after? Right. The, big the big Satan. And who is that? Us. Yeah. Thank God for the French. I didn't think I'd ever say that. <laughs> yes. 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 That's crazy. Isn't it? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Thank God. The French said no. It's a bad deal. Because they wanted, they were giving Iran anything they wanted. They said, we'll ease the sanctions. And then we found out that the president had been easing the sanctions without going through Congress. He wouldn't do that because that's against the Constitution. Yes. So I see you've been listening to the news. He said, well, why is that important to us? 
Because Israel is the number one sign of Jesus coming back. And the Bible says all nations will turn against Israel. Mm -hmm. And all is all. But it also says this. I will curse the nation that turns against Israel. Right. So now, the Congress has been coming up with all these different ways to, to put more restrictions upon Iran. Not knowing that the president was easing them. <laughs> okay? And now Kerry is coming to the Congress and the president, making pressure upon them, saying, oh no, we're going to ease the sanctions, not add more. And if you add more, it means we're going to go to war. And if we go to war, guess whose fault it is? You Republicans. Yeah. Oh. Gee right. whiz, John Kerry was the race you know, I mean, this is where we're at, people. I'm telling you uh -huh. that because what is the thing that Satan wants to do? Do away with the Word of God. Do away with Israel. Uh -huh. Erode the truth, the foundations. I mean, this is where we're at, and we're watching it come together. And the very people that God said would be at the table, this time, he's, they're there. Amen. They're there. Russia is going to Egypt to take up the slack where the United States has failed them. And we have been paying Egypt billions of dollars a year to keep peace with Israel. Wow. You, you see how it's all falling in place? What did God say? Do not make covenants with God's enemies. But Russia is coming to the forefront. Why is that important? Because Ezekiel 38, 39 teaches us that Russia, Magog, would lead a Muslim army, a Muslim confederacy to attack Israel when Israel thinks she's at peace. When will Israel think she's at peace? After we're gone and she signs a peace treaty with the Antichrist. Do you see that? <laughs> what? And you say, well, woman, that's scary. No. It means Jesus is coming and we're out of here. Be gone. <laughs> Enough? Okay. We're out of here. Let's finish this. He says, <clears throat> religious progressives. See, we're sticking to mud. <laughs> okay? We're hateful. That's right. We're haters. We're actually haters. That's what they're called. Religious progressives, for example, assert that the true benchmark for biblical ethics is not the Bible at all, but only what Jesus uttered in his red letter sayings. This position creates the comfortable option of alleging that Jesus never discussed homosexuality or abortion. Okay? Even though he affirmed traditional marriage as the only God-ordained model, never condoned sexual promiscuity, though he forgave it and affirmed the sanctity of life. But since he didn't use the word abortion, and he didn't use the word homosexual, and he didn't use the word dinosaur, or even rapture, <laughs> see? This is why, you know, people say, well, what version? Be careful. I mean, if you, if you was in a bookstore and you saw a Bible that said the golden rule Bible, you'd think, Whoa, that sounds so good. I'm going to buy one of them. <laughs> See, what I'm, they use good stuff to cover up. To cover up. There are several problems. Listen. There are several problems with the red letter approach. Now, this is not new because I said Jefferson had a red letter Bible printed up with just the sayings of Jesus. First, it shares uh, commonality with the Jesus Seminar. And I'm sure you've heard of that. I know I've taught that here. A group of academic New Testament doubters and radicals who years ago argued that Jesus sayings were mostly reliable. <laughs> but nearly everything else in the Gospels is not. See, they, they want to... And you say, well, is that new? No. What was the lie told in Genesis chapter 3? Mm -hmm. Did God say that? What did he say? What was he doing? Are you sure God said that? You, do you think that's what he meant? You will not surely die. Do you see that as Satan's Amen. 
And he has started in Genesis and brought it right up to this day where they're saying, are you sure Jesus said that? Are you sure God said that? How could you be sure that this is the word of God? God help us. God helps. And that's why some of these religious people start backing up and say, well, they don't want to look to be stick in the muds. <laughs> Listen to what he says. Second, the red letter approach avoids the uncomfortable fact that Jesus often referred to the Old Testament. See, that makes the New Testament church angry. Right. But Jesus quoted the Old Testament over and over and over again. People keep forgetting. He said, I came to fulfill it, not do away with it. I'd much rather be fulfilled than done away with. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He said, he, and what did he do? The feast days, we just come through that. Every one of the feast days he went to and spoke in the synagogue. He said, I'm here to fulfill this. Here I am. After all this time, here I am. But they're saying, oh no, not the Old Testament. He, it, the Bible says he never distanced himself from its claims. He affirmed the authority of his apostles whose writings populate the New Testament. Jesus even said, do not think that I come to destroy this law or the prophets. Mm -hmm. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. But see, we have new prophets today who say that they are receiving word from God that really is not in this book. And it's more powerful than what's in this book because it's up to date. Mm -hmm. Okay. He said, a more frontal attack on the Bible comes from those who would rewrite it. Earlier this year, Dubai Publishing announced the release of its Golden Rule Bible. So if you see this anywhere, it's, it's a new translation that, according to the press releases, claims to reveal that Paul never condemned homosexuality. Oh. And you, you can really just put it on the computer, bring up the Golden Rule Bible. Right. Keeping into, no, keying into a supposed retranslation of the word itself. It is obviously a well-timed publication considering the explosive <laughs> debate in America over gay marriage. This week, Alaska became the 15th state to legalize homosexuality. 15. Okay. As that announcement arrived, an article on the theatlantic.com, you can check that too, quoting President Barack Obama's support for gay marriage as an example of the golden rule. And I will also tell you this. Some of the abortion clinics have now took a plaque and wrote on it what the Pope said and hung the plaque outside their abortion oh. clinics saying even the Pope sees the necessity. Now, he didn't say that. No, he didn't. He, he said we were going to revisit some of yeah. these things. He, you know, he said we're going to revisit the priest being able to get married you know, in hopes of stopping some of the child molesting and so on. We're going to revisit some of these things. He didn't say, oh, I agree with abortion and you should kill babies, but they're they're heading in that direction. Okay? This is what he said. Yet, any intellectually honest look at the Apostle Paul's Greek text in Romans 1.27 reveals the biblical position. <laughs> Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Paul used the same Greek word Mark used, which recorded Jesus saying, God made them male and female. But see, they have to change that. And you know, when I read that last week about they had asked several million people, about removing under God. 
And 97% of them said remove it. Only 3% stood and said no, don't remove it. Who did they Yeah. Well, you don't think they're going to ask us. But yeah, they should, but they're not going to. Yeah. <laughs> because they want it to look like the majority is ruling and you have no choice. Just like that school they announced this morning who does these boxes for children. Yeah. And they said, you're not doing that. It's too Christian. And Christian is not even involved in it. But they told them, you can't do this for Christmas. They're, we're they're, we're going to remove Christ out of Christmas altogether. You'll not be doing any of those things at Christmas. So rather than yes. fight it, they said, well, it sounds like the majority rules, and we can't afford to fight this, so we're just going to go along with it. Did, do you remember hearing about prayer being taken out of the schools before it was taken out? No. Yeah. See, I mean, think about it. People are not listening. Biblically, no, biblical fidelity and the belief in authenticity and plenary inspiration of Scripture is becoming increasingly important for the church, particularly as America continues its downward slide from being irritably impatient to overly, I mean, overtly condemning those who take the Bible seriously. What that's saying is this. You are Bible thumper. You just take that too serious. You've gone too far. You're a fanatic. Mm -hmm. You're one of those literal people, aren't you? <laughs> this is a new age we're living in. You need to come up. <laughs> you need. We're progressing. That's right. I mean, but see, then they look at you as though you're the hater. You're the one that's causing the problem. Can't you drop? That's just your opinion. No, it's not your opinion. It's what the Word says. Oh, but that's not the absolute truth. And that's exactly what Satan said to Eve. Do you see? It's the same lie. And remember when I, when I was teaching you about education and how they said, well, no, it's the knowledge and the facts aren't important anymore. It's how you experience things. Remember when they changed from the facts to the experiencing in the schools? What did they call that? Morris. I can't remember his name. His, name was, his last name was Morris. And they changed that over to, where, oh no, we need the children to experience these things. And then question them on how that make you feel. Yeah. Right, now they're sending out the letters to the churches. What is it you want to hear or don't want to hear? What will keep you coming to this church? What will keep you supporting this ministry? You know? Mm -hmm. And I guess they count the votes and say, well, wait a minute, the majority don't want us to talk about hell anymore. It scares them. The majority don't want us to mention homosexuality anymore because it's so rampant. The majority of people don't want to talk about divorce. Well, you know what? We just need to keep them happy. <coughs> That's where we are. That's where we are, seeker friendly. Seeker friendly. And you might think, and you can research this yourself, I did. Where would you think the seeker friendly movement began? In the Southern Baptist Church. That would have been the last place in the world I would have thought it began. Yes, aren't you? I was shocked. Yeah. It began there and spread across the country. And then they changed the names. They changed the names of the churches to community things. Mm -hmm. yeah. To where you wouldn't know what denomination this is. what denom Then they said, well, let's just be a non-denomination. Listen, I'm not even a non-denomination. <laughs> That's a denomination. That's a denomination. <laughs> no, what we're doing, we're coming back to Christian. Amen. You know? And standing on the complete word of God. This is why Paul said, oh, you need to contend for the faith. Right. You need to stick to the truth. Why? Because he knew, God put it in his heart, that in the last days we'd have all these false teachers and they would be eroding at the foundation little by little by little till you just fall right through the floor. <laughs> That's where we are. And let's go on. I'm going to finish this because this is good. It says, uh, 
Let me find my place. As things progress, they call this progression. As things progress, the church will be tempted to avoid clearly teaching the word. Two bus drivers got fired this week because they prayed with a child. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Now, of course, if they had molested the child, they'd have went to court. You know, all, you know, that's right. That's right. Recently, two influential court rulings have attacked the church. In the first case, a U.S. Supreme Court majority struck down the essential portion of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. I was really surprised that they did that. The Defense of Marriage. Which had defined marriage as being between one man and one woman. I guess that's why the man married his horse last week. <laughs> he was in a top hat and tie. The court took an astonishing swipe at congressmen who had, who had supported the DOMA Act. Look what they did to Rick Santorum. Yeah. Yeah. Just because he stood against, yeah. you know, he stood for marriage. Mm -hmm. Specifically attacking those who voted for it because of its con consistency with the Judeo-Christian morality. Here's the problem, is tolerance. They're using the word tolerance. But it's... Christians are to be tolerant for this and this and this and this, and no one is to be tolerant toward the Christian. Right. You see? That's where we are. Justice Antonio Scalia, I always have trouble pronouncing his name, is, <coughs> thank you, is in his dissenting opinion, <laughs> okay, he had a vote, gave Americans fair warning that the decision unfortunately means followers of the Judean Christian principles, those who value, values uh, located or in the Bible, are now considered enemies of the human race. Did you hear him say that in the news? No. No. Because they pick and choose what they're going to put on there. Sure. Yeah. Then, New Mexico Supreme Court ruled that a Christian photographer had no religious yes. right to refuse to photograph same-sex ceremonies. Yeah. As one of the justices noted, Christians must compromise in order to get along in our multicultural, pluralistic society. You either compromise or else. They're coming. They're coming. And just like this thing with Iran, Stop there. Just like this thing with Iran. Netanyahu come on and he said, We're going to defend ourselves. Whether you're with us or not. Iran is not willing to change anything. But then he held up a book. I've got to try and find that, Kyle. This book was written by the new leader of Iran. But in this book, he tells his people that they are to change their voice a little. They're to lighten up. They're to sound a little more friendly. <laughs> that they are to deceive the people. While, and to, to uh, hinder them from going forward to stall for time. Mm -hmm but continue to do what they're doing while they're stalling for time. And he wrote a book telling them to do exactly what he's doing. Netanyahu holds up the book and says, we can follow it right here step by step, exactly what he said he was going to do, and you people are listening. And being deceived in their Bible. It's not a sin to lie to us. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's not a sin to them. Because they intend to destroy Israel and then us. Right. And Iran, if Iran gets that bomb, and now they said in Washington that it's very possible they could they have the ability now to put that together in four to six weeks whenever they're ready. And they're telling Israel, don't attack them. And, they're t and our president's telling Congress, don't put any more restrictions on them. If you do, 
We're going to go to war and lose all the peace talk that we've already gained. In other words, the concession you have yeah, that's right. given them. Yeah, so that's they're true. telling us to not I'm only to compromise back. with the world, to compromise <clears throat> with this book. And I'm telling you, look up, Jesus is coming. All the confederacies mm -hmm. are in place. That's All true. the players are on the field. We're waiting for the sound of that trumpet. We're out of here. But while we're waiting, we need to get people saved. I mean, that is our commission, not to make you feel better, not to have for you to have the best life that you could possibly have here. Listen, life here is short. Eternity is forever. That's the most important thing, is to get people saved. To get them saved and know that Jesus is coming. Please, contend for the faith. This golden rule Bible, tell people what it is. Tell them what it is. And this new prophetic movement, progressive, tell people what it is. Don't fall in. Well, I know you're not going to fall into it. You're grounded. You know but how many of them out there don't? And they'll just tell you, oh, Greg, it just sounds so good. Do we have to, do we have to pick on those things? Can't we talk about something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stand firm. Stand firm. God bless you.